think in Manchester, like a lot of the kind of universities around the country, students have just been treated absolutely appallingly. Um, we were lied to when we were brought here, especially first years, I think, you know, we were told that we would have a safe campus with a blend of face-to-face -face, um, and online teaching. Whereas, you know, it was very evident as soon as we got here and we'd given them our 9K for tuition and our, you know, several thousand pounds for accommodation. And that was all just a lie to get us to give them their money. Um, and that all these sort of structures uh, were never actually in place. Um, I think, you know, paired with the Tory government's competencies, universities showed that, like, they don't actually care about the students um, and they don't even care about our safety. You know, we were brought here um, in Manchester, particularly, it was immediately a COVID hotspot. Um, thousands and thousands of students tested COVID positive. My flat had seven positive COVID, uh, COVID tests. Um, and instead of, you know, helping us and instead of, you know, seeing students as what we are, like just young people trying to be educated, we were then blamed for this crisis, we were scapegoated, we were um, blamed for bringing up the local COVID uh, rates um, and there was a complete lack of support. So I think like lots of universities around the country, there wasn't food boxes at first, there wasn't really any um, structures in place like they promised. Uh, it's really hard to kind of comprehend how after all the government advice or all the advice to the government and all the other advice, they didn't have these things in place. So, when we first started isolating, we received an email, you know, pointing us to delivery and stuff, and then saying if we couldn't uh, find um, delivery slots, that we should just go to the shops and wear a mask, and that you know, if we needed laundry or if we needed to do our post, we should just go and wear a mask, which is not just unsafe but completely illegal, and also um, just presenting more danger to other students and to the wider community. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we had to kind of move out of our homes, you know, the first time we were ever living away from home, living with eight strangers in my flat. Um, obviously we got on, but not everyone did. And so student mental health, sorry, I always get this. I, I don't think my laptop has the best audio. I'll just speak loud. Um, yeah, so student mental health was immediately kind of um, put awfully and the university just didn't seem to care. Um, at the end of the day, universities are being run like businesses and it became very clear this year, um, as with lots of other things with, you know, lotting staff with voluntary severance and sending cleaners into COVID positive flats. The university is only on the side of the money. Um, in Manchester, Nancy Rothwell, the vice chancellor, earns, I think, almost £300,000, um, while students are, you know, risking their own safety um, to kind of fund this sort of business system. Um, I think the A-level protests over the summer, however, did show that, you know, students, we have this power, um, we're kind of uniquely placed that we have all this power in the university thing, we are where they get their money, um, and, you know, we weren't going to be manipulated, so there's been a lot of fight back on campus, a lot of anger, um, which in Manchester, you know, we started doing a rent strike after being only at uni for two weeks, because it was just evident that we needed to fight back, there was, um, you know, there was appalling accommodation in halls, maintenance uh, requests were just not being pulled through, security was awful, um, there were rat infestations, my flat currently has a silverfish infestation which just hasn't been dealt with, um, and the university was just doing nothing about that, so we, you know, threatened to withhold our rent, we had a couple hundred students doing that, um, but the university ignored us, they just sent kind of um, intimidating and fear-mongering emails to students saying that they would find people by 3% per day, um, which again is just illegal and we actually did speak to lawyers but you know for working class students particularly that makes it really hard to join in these rent strikes um, and join this join in with all this protest. Um, I think a lot of it culminated when the University of Manchester put fences up around our accommodation uh, which you know really put the nail in the coffin that we were not being seen as actual human beings but we were seen as cash cows and money. Um, as I said, student mental health was absolutely awful. We already had a boy die on campus and the fences just felt like the university was asking uh, history to repeat itself. Um, waking up to see your entire building, every building on campus enclosed in these fences um, and no communication from the university uh, was just disgusting and it you know, caused a lot of anger amongst students. So a few weeks after that, we decided to occupy a building on campus. Um, and again, the university ignored us um, until two weeks later when we did finally win the um, you know, the 30% rent reduction, which is, yeah, the biggest in UK student history. Um, not only that, but we are going to continue rent striking in January, and I think this has hopefully catalyzed a lot of people to, continue to you know, start rent strikes at other universities, I know Bristol, Cambridge, York, there are a lot of them going on. Um, 
and I think Queen Mary's as well, and a lot of London universities, um, which is really inspiring to see. We're, pay we're paying for the profit of um, the, you know, the minority at the top. The increase in rent of over 5% um, in Manchester, where whilst we're not actually getting the same facilities that we're paying for, you know, we don't have access to subsidised bars, we don't have access to um, online facilities, and the workload is just insane, um, given that, you know, I've never stepped foot on campus, I haven't met a single lecturer, um, I haven't been in a single university building, the only time I've been to the university has been to protest. Um, so yeah, I think this is a lot bigger than just Fallowfield and Manchester, it's more about the way that students are treated, um, you know, under capitalism, and students, I think, you know, are unique based um, kind of alongside the working class in that, you know, we have this power um, and we're not yet part of that sort of body of capitalism. Um, and I think it really allows um, the sort of radical ideas to kind of really, um, yeah, increase and flourish on campus. Um, every student here is, you know, considering rent striking in January. And I think a lot of students around the country are as well. Um, and yeah, so it's really exciting to see. I'm not sure how long I spoke for. I could say more. Um, thanks very much, Izzy. Um, I think, you know, what's happened in Manchester really shows that, you know, when students and young people kind of, you know, get organised, um, it is possible to actually you know, forced institutions to not treat us absolutely appallingly. And I think the way that Manchester students have shown that has been really inspiring. Um, our next speaker that I'm going to introduce is um, Chin Chakwadin Ma, who is a activist with in um, the Socialist Workers Party and the author of the forthcoming book, A Rebel's Guide to Walter Rodney. Um, Chin's going to speak for about 20-25 minutes and then we're going to have some time for um, discussion and so on. So, Chin. Thanks. I think the key question that I want to answer here today is um, why is the working class the most revolutionary class? And before I go into answering the question, I think I want to clarify how we as Marxists understand class. And I think it's important to do that because you see, before I became a socialist, when I was about like Izzy's age, I never saw myself as a member of the working class. Actually, um, I thought I was middle class. And I thought I was middle class because, you know, I grew up in a pretty nice house. You know, I got on holiday every summer. And right now I have a master's degree from a OK university. And on the other hand, I thought that someone who was working class could only be someone who, you know, lived on a council estate and who was destined to a lifetime of manual labor on low wages. Now, you see, the point here is that I had a complete misunderstanding of the concept of class, because understanding which class you belong to does not depend on how you view yourself. It doesn't depend on your lifestyle. And it doesn't really depend on whether you own over 25 grand a year or not. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that class is not something that is subjective. It is not something that comes from your individual consciousness or what you think about yourself. Also, another thing I would say is that, you know, class is not a thing that can be studied in isolation from other factors. And the key point is that we as Marxists, we see class as an objective social relationship. And what we're interested in here is what we want to know is how one group of people are related to another group of people through their particular relationship to the means of production. The means of production, if you want very quickly, are the tools and the, more, and the raw materials that human beings use together in order to make a living and produce wealth. And the key thing here is that for a small but significant part of human history, there has been a divide, a divide between those who own the means of production and those who don't. Think about the masters who owned the slaves in ancient times in the Roman in Empire. Think about in feudal times, the landlords who owned the land and exploited the serfs. And today in our capitalist society, we have a small minority, less than 1% of the world population who own 
the majority of the means of production. That means that they own the majority of the factories, the warehouse, uh, the machines, and all the instruments, if you want, that produce wealth. And these people are what we call the capitalist class. They are the owners, the major shareholders, and the board of directors, if you like, of large corporations today. But on the other side, you have th those who don't own the means of production. And the vast majority of these people, not all of them, but the vast majority are what we call the working class. And because the working class is deprived of the means of production, they have to sell their labor power to the capitalists. So you as the worker, you go work in the factories, in the warehouse uh, of the capitalists to create wealth for the capitalists that the capitalist takes in the form of profit. And, ex and in exchange, the capitalist gives you a wage that supposedly enables you to go eat, survive, pay food, uh, try to pay your rent if you can, and go back to work the next day. The other key thing here is that the wage that you get does not reflect in any kind of way the tons of wealth that you created for the capitalists in your working day, working week, or working year. And because the wage that the worker gets is much lower than the amount of wealth that he created for the capitalists, we Marxists say that the working class is an exploited class. Exploited because part of the work that you do for the capitalist is unpaid. And I think that there's one word in the English language that describes perfectly the condition of the working class. Um, you know, the, the thing that workers feel is the word is ripped off. You know, workers are a group that are constantly ripped off by the capitalists. And you see, there's always a conflict between the capitalists and the workers because capitalism is a system that is based on competition between different companies. And for a company to survive in this capitalist economy, to not get swallowed up by competition, it has to maximize profit. And one of the ways of maximizing profit is trying to squeeze more from your workers, trying to lower the wage of your workers. Just think about what the um, Tory government is trying to do today by implementing a pay freeze on the public sector. You know, those are one of the many ways and strategies that they have to squeeze more profits out of their workers. Now that I define more or less what class is, I'm going to answer the question, why is the working class the most revolutionary class? You know, why did people like Karl Marx say that only the working class can smash capitalism and build a new society from below? And this is an interesting question because I talked about the workers and the capitalists, but in between the workers and the capitalists, you have, you have other classes. You, for instance, have the petty bourgeoisie, you know, people who are small business owners. These people, they employ their own labor most of the time, or sometimes they have one or two employees. So my dad, for instance, who's a personal trainer, fits into this category. Uh, another example of small business owners, you have peasants, for instance, you know, people who have their crops of land, um, very large group in the, in the third world. Uh, but another class that I also want to mention is what we as Marxists call the new middle classes. And this refers to basically to people who are the managers in large companies today. And what's interesting about this class is that like the workers, they are paid a wage, but we can't really say that they're exploited. Actually, we can't say at all that they're exploited because their job is not to work to create profit, but their job is to make sure that workers work more efficiently. That's why, you know, my boss at work, when I was at work, because I'm working from home, used to tell me, Chinedu, don't spend too long in the toilet because you'll make us lose money. You see, the role of this, of this managerial class is to enforce the rule of capital in the workplace. And if you leave aside the concept of class, you know, there, there are other groups in society um, that, mobil that are not revolutionary, but mobilize around their their, their common shared identity. You know, you can think, for instance, of uh, Black people in the Black Power movement during the 1960s. But the argument that I want to make is that none of these classes that I just mentioned, or these groups, are revolutionary because they don't have the power nor the coherence, if you want, to impose their leadership and their vision over the whole of society. 
I mean, if you take peasants, for instance, it's a very incoherent group. I mean, uh, peasants in the global south are actually very much divided between rich and poor peasants, and they don't share the common interests. And if you look at the peasantry, like every time I go to Tanzania, I'm always surprised that how far one peasant village is from the other, which makes, you know, organization, collective organization actually quite difficult to build. And people like, you know, Trotsky, um, a, a Russian Marxist who looks, who looks at peasants' revolts in Mexico and China, you know, these revolts don't happen very often. They happen like, you know, once every, every 40 years. Uh, if you compare that to the working class, I mean, there's not a year that goes by without the threat of a general strike. You can think about Sudan, Lebanon, or, or different um, France or different places in the world. And on the question of power and identity, you see, I am, a, as a Black person, I'm a victim of, of racism, which is terrible. But being a victim of racism doesn't necessarily give me any power. I have power you know, insofar as I'm a member of the working class. I'm a member of the working class so I can get my other colleagues to go and sh on strike and stop the profits, uh, stop the capitalists from making profits. So you see, this is what I'm aiming at. We as Marxists believe that the working class is the most revolutionary class because it occupies a strategic position within capitalist society that gives it more power and coherence than any other group. And I'm gonna talk about a few of these features. The first feature that gives the workers power is that, you know, if we, if we depend on the capitalists for a wage, well, on the other hand, the capitalists depend on us for a profit. So if the workers don't go to work, well, the whole system crumbles. And the first time I realized that, really was in 2016 when I saw um, a London tube, tube strike um, um, that lasted only 48 hours. See, it lasted only 48 hours, but in that time, I remember like the whole city of London came to a standstill. Nothing was working. And uh, I think the London economy lost about half a billion pounds. And that's the power of a small, very small group of, of workers something absolutely amazing. The other feature that I want to say is that the working class is not just a collection of individuals. The working class is a collective because everywhere that capitalism goes, it's always bound to create a working class, a working class concentrated in cities, concentrated in workplaces that tend to get bigger and bigger. And when you do that, well, you're bringing people together. And because the working class constantly faces pressure on their wages from employers who try to lower them, it, it is always forced into collective struggle. And it struggles through strikes, occupations, boycotts, demonstrations, you name it. The working class is the most militant class that history has ever seen. And once workers struggle, you see, reach a high point in society, the workers develop new collective democratic ways of organizing society. And you see, Marx talks about that when he's talking about this event called the Paris Commune. Um, it's a time where the working class took power for three months in Paris in 1871. And what did the workers do in those three months? It only lasted three months. But in those three months, first of all, they smashed the state. That means they managed to destroy the political and, uh, and military hierarchy that dominated their lives. They abolished the police and the army, and they replaced it with the people in arms, you know, to defend, to defend their revolution. Um, they gave universal voting rights to men. Uh, well, not women. They were not exactly perfect. But you see, one of the cool things that they did is that all the government elected officials um, could not receive wages that were higher than that of an ordinary worker. And all the government uh, elected officials, all the elected officials were, could be recalled, they were revocable at any time. And you see, that's what a working class that takes power for only three months can do. Imagine what it can do if we win for good on a global scale. Now, I want to talk about one or two myths and realities about the working class today because you see this is important because when when marx was writing 
the working class was only 2% of the world population. Today, I think over 50% are under some kind of well, wage labor. But even though the working class is, big, is bigger than it's ever been, there's commentators and intellectuals on the left, on the right, that think the working class has lost its power, that the working class is not even relevant anymore. And I only have time to deal with one of those arguments. But one of those arguments is that the working class has lost its power because too many of us are in comfortable office jobs, and therefore we are too bourgeois to fight the system anymore. Uh, you know, I've heard some people even say that uh, people who are in office jobs are not really working class anymore, they're, they're actually middle class. Now, this argument is absolutely nonsense. If you have any doubt about who is working class and who is not, you have to look about who is struggling today. And, you know, an example, look, look at what the University of Brighton is doing right now. The people who are on strike at the University of Brighton are lecturers and, and, uh, and uh, PhD students, the people who have the so-called comfortable office jobs. No, they are facing attacks on their wages, on their pensions, on their living conditions, etc., especially on the COVID. Uh, and the idea that, um, you know, um, office jobs are middle class jobs um, is a ridiculous one. That idea was probably true in the 19th century, for instance, when uh, being an administrator was, you know, an elite position where there was actually few administrators and it was a job that required large, amount, large amounts of skill. Now, if you look with the development of capitalism and the advancement of technology, this job, the job of the administrator has become extremely simplified because what do you have in the workplace right now? You have computers, scanners, photocopies, all these things that actually simplify the job and that made the pay of an administrator uh, actually quite, quite low nowadays. And I'll tell you an anecdote because, you know, I used to work in retail for a while and then um, I got a job, uh, a, an admin job at a university. And, you know, I really thought uh, back in the day that I was moving up in the world because, you know, um, uh, I thought it was it was something much better. So, you know, I went to work with my suit and tie, uh, looking all fresh, looking all fly. And I realized that my colleagues were actually wearing jeans and, and hoodies. And the thing is, the, the most crucial part that I want to make is that the job wasn't interesting at all. It was something very alienating, very monotonous, where you're just where you're just like um, putting data onto a computer, just like me being a retailer uh, at Foils processing books and payments all days, you know, something very monotone about this. So the final point I want to make is that, you know, what, what the office worker and the retail worker and perhaps the, uh, the, the factory worker all have in common is that they're deprived of the means of production and exploited. But because they are exploited, they have the power to get rid of capitalism, which is a rotten system. Thank you.